Hi hey everyone, you are listening to Voice of Aroha on frequency 106.1 FM from Wellington, New Zealand. This show is generously supported by our partner and sponsor, Host International NZ, Wellington Access Radio and Changemakers Resettlement Forum. Joining us today, um, we have Cordian co-hosting with me and we have our lovely guest, Golriz Garaman, joining us from the Green Party. How are you? We're really... Um, Good, yeah, I'm excited to be here. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Um, we just wanted to start this off with um, just hearing more about yourself and your decision to particularly run with the Green Party and um, become a member of parliament. Yeah, um, <laughs> it's been, I feel like it's been a long journey. I come from a, a very politically active family and I feel like that kind of fight for democracy and human rights is a little bit in my blood. Um, being from that sort of that generation that was born into that revolution in Iran. Um, and then we eventually moved here and, um, and you know, and I, you know, people may, may or may not know, but we came to New Zealand as asylum seekers, as political asylum seekers, my parents and I, and we were granted refugee status. And I remember that always being, um, you know, my parents were constantly kind of pointing that out to me, you know, in terms of like, see, they have democracy here and this is what we were fighting for. And this, you know, there's, um, and so I, I saw those as being really core Iranian values and that, that we were able to access here in New Zealand. And so I've kind of uh, felt like my job is to make sure I, I serve, whether it's human rights or democracy in some way, because I, I got to make it, you know, here. Um, but the Green Party is, I mean, the Green Movement really um, feels like my home because I think there's that kind of aspect of recognizing that New Zealand and New Zealand is beautiful and green and our environment is so important to us and that those things are connected with inequality and with democracy and, um, and you know, putting limits on greed. And that's the connection between protecting the environment and protecting people. Um, and I remember growing up and being kind of really interested in human rights and being in those student movements. And I remember Ahmed Zawi, who was an asylum seeker who came here and was detained um, years ago under that kind of war on terror um, language that unfortunately New Zealand had brought into as well in that George Bush era. And it was always the Green Party MPs that would turn up to our protests and would stand with us. It was such an emotional thing for me to realize um, that there were members of parliament in New Zealand who knew, you know, what we, you know, what refugees were, what Middle Easterners were, um, yeah. who, who would stand with us. So, and then I learned more and then I kind of, I love the values, so. <laughs> I like that you brought that up because it's no secret that you advocate, I feel like against the status quo, your party is already very progressive but you kind of take it a step further and don't shy away from supporting let's say Palestinians advocating for prisoners rights um, which I think is very imperative in a system that disproportionately affects Maori. Uh, you called for the removal of troops for from middle from the Middle East which for me as an Iraqi was huge. Yeah. Um, so I just wanted to know I feel like, of course, there's backlash when it comes to this, especially in your workplace. Um, people are very scared to go against like the normal kind of discourse around these topics. Um, so how do you deal with that? Yeah, I feel like people sort of um, think of very progressive values as being Western values. But, you know, where I come from, um, where you, you know, <laughs> in the Middle East, across the Middle East, often, you know, lawyers, human rights lawyers are political activists and they're prisoners as well. Mm -hmm. Very often, you know, we get tortured for, the, for that kind of rhetoric um, in politics. And, and in particular, when I went to the, into the law, I remembered that. Um, and I just, I do really hold those values really dear. I, I do look at things like um, prisoners losing their rights in New Zealand as being a slippery slope towards something that we don't want here. You know, we don't want the government to, to judge people based on our mo morality when it comes to basic human rights. Um, we, we want a justice system that's not racist. Um, and we, you know, and as New Zealanders do stand for peace, but I don't think most people understood that we had troops in America's wars 
in the Middle East. And that means, I mean, that means a lot to me as well. You know, we all kind of, we all know what it feels like to have these foreign troops just almost secretly there. It's very degrading and yeah. it is exactly what's stopping the Middle East from moving forward. Um, so it was, it was really meaningful to, to say, okay, well, I'm not just going to be the first refugee in here and then quietly sit here and, and just blend in. Um, we've got to say, we've got to talk with our voice and, you know, stand for those issues. Yeah. Do you think it's do you think it's difficult um, bringing those ideas forward when you're in a coalition government? I think it's um, it can be really difficult sometimes to get those wins, but it's you have to bring it up. You know, you have to fight for it. Um, there's kind of it's a really fast moving um, context and environment in Parliament. You often have these meetings that are only fifteen minutes, and you know you get to sit down with the minister and. I became really aware of the fact that you have to bring it up. You, it's now or never, you know, <laughs> and then it, it can trigger something and you, you know, you make sure that people know that that is important to you. Um, I feel like in the Green Party, I've always been given the support and the freedom to do that as well, to kind of say, whether it was, you know, after the Christchurch terror attack happened, you know, being able to say, no, we have to say this was racism and we have to say that it exists here in New Zealand because that community has been reporting it for years. Mm -hmm. You know, the Islamic Women's Council had been reporting hate crimes and hate speech for years. Mm -hmm. We can't just sort of blend into the whole, which is saying, this is not us. That's, that's nice, you know, we, we don't, I think most New Zealanders felt like we don't want this to be us and that's great. <laughs> but, but some of our communities, you know, are actually experiencing it and I can't just pretend like that's not happening. So. It, it's nice to have that freedom as a member of a small progressive party to give voice to diverse experiences, mm. to really, really represent those experiences um, rather than to just be a face. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and just going off of that, why do you think a Labour-Green coalition is important? Um, because I think some people are hesitant to vote for Green um, because they want Jacinda to be prime minister. And I think the thing that, that I think that they might not know is that she'll still be prime minister if they were to party vote green. It just means they're gonna be more progressive policies included within that. So yeah. tell us a bit about that. Absolutely. So we're incredibly lucky in New Zealand to have an MMP system, which means that every vote can count for, for minor parties, you know, and the Green Party has always got over 5% and, you know, inshallah, we will <laughs> again. Yes. Um, but but um, that means that we can, we can hold our politicians to account and put them into a government that represents different ideas. And for us, that means on the progressive side of the political spectrum, Jacinda will definitely be the prime minister uh, with a vote for the Green Party. We've made that really, really clear. We're not dancing around going with national or whatever else. But the real risk is if we don't get in, national could potentially form a government with ACT and some other small parties. So actually it gets a bit scary the other way. Yeah. Um, when, we, when you think about if the Green Party doesn't get in, but we have shown that we will support a Labour Party government and we will bring that really progressive voice um, to pull Labour towards some of those ideas, whether they're um, standing for race equality, whether it's human rights, whether it's environmental justice. Um, and, you know, we've put all of our cost of policies out there. <laughs> so people know exactly what they're voting for. And the more votes we get, the more chances there are of us getting some of those green wins, mm. you know, pulling the troops um, out of the Middle East could only happen if there was at least one person campaigning for it. And that's exactly what happened. So it's, that's the beauty of the MMP system. Yeah. I think one thing um, this whole year has shown us, especially with this pandemic, is students have been left out of the conversation pretty much the whole time. There is little to no support um, when it comes to students. And um, I wanted to know more about what, what, how is the Green Party choosing to support students, um, especially if they were to return to government next term? Yeah, for me, it was really interesting to see how um, an older generation of people saw the fees freeze as being the core way that we support students, whereas for students, this generation, it's actually cost of living. It's things like services that people need to get, whether it's mental health care, health care, whether it's housing, whether it's public transport. 
and that cost of living being covered through a baseline student benefit. So it's nice to have the fees frozen, but that's not what's stopping people in marginalized communities or in working communities from accessing higher education. Um, and it was really interesting that there's, there's a generation of Kiwis who sort of hasn't remembered that. And, mm. and, and um, so we got the fees freeze, but for the Green Party, the focus is on um, having the cost of public transport for all students, for example, um, the mental health trial, which is free uh, mental health care access for all under 25 year olds, because we don't think that people should be at a point of crisis before they can access mental health care. Uh, that's incredibly dangerous and incredibly unfair. And that's the way that our country has been operating until now. Um, we, our poverty action plan, which is a piece that I'm really proud of, suggests a fairer tax system, which will mean that people with wealth of over a million dollars will pay just 1% more, and it affects only 6% of New Zealanders, but that means that we can provide a baseline benefit to everyone who needs it. That means every student. And the baseline benefit is $325, on top of which people can get other subsidies for housing mm. whatever else they need. Yeah. Um, and we have a cost of policy of clearing all of the state house um, uh, backlogs within five years so that's kind of starting to get people access to all of the things that we need so we can actually take the time take the mental space and go and access um, higher education and I mean that's got to be better for everyone in New Zealand we don't want just the wealthy to be able to live um, a life where they get to choose what you know what to do and what to study yeah so Colrus you have mentioned about this uh, tax taking from the rich people of one percent <laughs> so some people are will ask that is this that kind of you make them to the wealthier people who own the businesses to run out from the country so the way that i mean as i say it impacts only the proportion of wealth that's over a million dollars and it only impacts that that proportion of wealth by one percent so it actually only and there's only six percent of new zealanders who are in that bracket so it's extreme wealth um, the thing that's different about it is, is that we're talking about wealth rather than just income, because a lot of people who become successful aren't generationally accumulating wealth. They're not, they're not sitting on millions and millions of dollars worth of property. You just have a higher income. So we don't want to focus on just them. That's what the tax system has been like um, so far, and it has ignored people that have sort of inherited into, into property, which has caused the property crisis, for example, the housing crisis. So focusing on wealth, only taxing the extremely wealthy and only taxing that proportion of their wealth that falls above a million dollars by 1% means that we can make all of society more equal. And again, to kind of draw on my experience um, coming from Iran, you know, that's a place where there is real wealth inequality and only the wealthy are actually accessing some of, you know, some of the incredible lifestyles that people can have in, in a place like Iran and whether it's mm. um, medicine or, um, you know, um, homes with adequate heating. And that's not what we want for New Zealand. We want New Zealand to be exactly what we all as migrants have come here for, which is a land of equal opportunity and only through a fair tax system that then gives back um, and pours that money into our education system and healthcare system and public transport and housing, will we all actually be able to say our kids can grow up um, and become whoever they want to become and, and we have access to, to that sort of equality that we've come here for. Well, that's understandable. And also in terms of we're talking about tax and economy. <laughs> So I have a question. So many people in the community have asked me to transfer this question. It's about GST system. So you know, we have a GST on a food services. Like if you're buying good simple food from Pack and Safe and whoever, wherever, there's a GST on it, but there's no GST on a gold, gold, pure gold. Yeah, so I know. It's any, any thinking about to change this policy? In the next I agree. Year? And, and it was the National Party who actually raised GST. And GST is, it, as exactly as you say, it, it's a tax that we pay on everything, including essential products. But we don't pay it on things like, you know, gold and, <laughs> and yeah. the, the big stuff, um, which is exactly why our tax system is unfair. Um, we absolutely believe in the Green Party that we, we need to relook at GST, and in particular on, on essentials. So on food that's healthy and, you know, on fruit, vegetables, bread, you know, things that people need to raise families. Um, and we're taxing 15%. And we know that that just goes on to, on to the consumer. 
Um, so it does it affects everyone equally, no matter what your income is, and that's not a fair tax system. So it's absolutely such a good point. Mm -hmm. Cool. And, and so moving from that, there's more questions specifically about refugee background communities. So Wiener Green is advocating for increasing the number. So the question is here, like, what's the Green Party policy toward refugees? And also, if you are increasing the number, how are you all going to manage that with the resource that we have in New Zealand? Yeah, through a fair tax system. No. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so we believe that in New Zealand to be an, a responsible international citizen must raise the refugee quota. Um, we were really proud to be part of a government that did double the refugee quota from what it had been since 1986. Um, I'm also particularly proud that the Green Party didn't stop there. We made it a bottom line in our confidence and supply agreement with Labour that they would also review family reunification numbers for refugees. Um, so that has now been doubled as well. That means 300 more um, families can be reunited with each other. And what I'm particularly proud of, because this is something that you have to kind of be connected with the refugee families to know about, is that we also got financial support for those families. Um, because we know that people were separated from their immediate family members just because they had to save up for the flights, you know, for years. And refugee communities don't come here with all of their wealth that they, you know, that, that, that you, can, you can access as any other community. You know, you can't, saving up for flights would take people a couple of years. Um, so we won $21 million over three years to support um, the reunification of refugee families. And that will likely cover the cost of flights, um, visas, an immigration lawyer, all of these thousands of dollars that people were having to pay just to see their families. Um, we know that refugees, here stop having to access mental health services within a couple of months after family mm -hmm. reunification happens. It's really, really important for our families. So we doubled those numbers as a green win. Um, but our policy is to, to keep going and raise the refugee quota over five years up to 4,000. Um, that will mean that New Zealand's refugee quota per capita, considering our size, is still only a little bit higher than Australia and still lower than Canada. So we've got to do more. Our refugee quota is far too low considering our size and resource. And I think for far too long, people have blamed refugees and migrants for really complicated problems like housing, like traffic, um, like the lack of healthcare and mental healthcare in New Zealand, which would have been solved had governments wanted to invest in those things. There's absolutely enough for everyone here. We didn't need the tax cuts of the previous government. We don't need to have, you know, we have no tax on, on capital when you buy and sell homes as your business, basically. You know, so those things are, those things are there and they're in our systems um, and they're unfair for everyone, including for Kiwis who are trying to make a go of it and, and struggling to survive. Audrey, I'm sorry, I'm going to butt in here, but uh, Golris, I think one, like you just brought this up, I feel like under every kind of post to do with refugees, it's, um, you should be housing the homeless, um, suddenly everybody cares about the homeless when, <laughs> you know, yeah. only when it comes to refugees, which is very unfortunate. Um, what is your response to those kinds of comments where people think refugees are here to take everybody's rights, take everybody's homes, um, you know, just to de depend on the country all of a sudden? Yeah, it, it's it's incredible how much people suddenly care about poverty and housing um, the minute we talk about refugees. And, you know, we know that the previous government literally sold off the state houses. And that's why people became homeless. People were living in, in their cars. That wasn't because more refugees were coming here, because more refugees were definitely not coming here. Yeah. Um, we know that Auckland's traffic condition exists because successive governments have failed to put any kind of resource into public transport. Our public transport system is completely debunked um, and incredibly expensive. Um, so all of these things, all of these problems exist and they've been ignored. Um, and we've seen it time and again in history. We've seen it all around the world where it's just so easy to say to people who are struggling, oh, well, it's because of that other person that looks different and sounds different. It's their fault that you're struggling. It can't possibly be the people in power who've ignored you and who've left you wanting. 
Um, but absolutely, we need to solve the housing crisis. We absolutely have enough in New Zealand to solve it. And COVID actually taught us that because within a couple of days, we housed everybody really quickly, yeah. um, at least you know for the time being, but we could have done that immediately. There was no reason for us to have people out on the street. We found money to give everybody far more than we give them under the social welfare system now to stay home. There's, there's enough there if we want to do it. And our housing fall policy, which is also completely costed, um, shows that we can do housing differently. We can um, put together a rent to own scheme so people aren't paying these incredibly high rents and then ending up never owning a house. Because actually the scheme should be that you end up owning your house and that should be supported by the government. The state houses need to be rebought and rebuilt. Um, and we can do that within five years, we can clear the entire backlog. Um, and we need to introduce a capital gains tax so that people don't profit from this ballooning um, housing market. So people can actually afford to buy their first homes without subsidizing someone's property investment portfolio. Um, if the governments had the will to do those things, we could absolutely host far more refugees um, and everybody in New Zealand. That, that's cool. That's cool. Good, <laughs> Good thoughts uh, from Green Party. Uh, another move to another same topic about refugees. You know, you witness about the current resettlement system that we have. So tell us how much you see that system is successful. Yeah, um, one thing I would really like, I mean, the two things around the edges that I'd say is we act, we need to open up a res the resettlement support services to asylum seekers and also to family members being reunified. So that's that's the two things that we would definitely change as the Greens. Um, in terms of the resettlement centre, it certainly needs more resource, but it, it in terms of running it as a volunteer system, I don't know that I would necessarily change that because I know the volunteers are <laughs> I love it. Um, but but we would we would fund um, services that could be ongoing, so you could refer back to you know I know that people get um, doc access to doctors and mental health professionals when they they're in Mangere as the resettlement centre, but then it's quite difficult for them to be kind of cut off and and reliant on different. Um, uh, volunteers to kind of help them to integrate into the community as wonderful as those volunteers are it would be nice to have a centralized system that the government supports which can be ongoing and people can actually access and I know social work for example is really difficult for people to access and we need to have bespoke um, programs for refugees and what we would call marginalized migrant communities um, so that, you know, social workers that, that have access to sort of culturally appropriate ways of helping people are available. And we know our social work um, community are under a lot of pressure right now. And they've kind of spoken out about this as well. And they'd like to be able to help people, whether it's with family violence, whether it's in just mm -hmm. accessing services that refugees need support with, um, whether it's mental health care, mm -hmm. enrollment, employment. Um, we would like to fund social so, work that's actually trained to help refugees. Right. So a quick question for this. Uh, mm -hmm. how, how much do you give it the right? One to five. Five is the great, one is nothing. So very good or not good? If you write the, the system. Um, I, think the on, I think the initial part is good, but then the ongoing support's lacking. So then people are just in the community without you know, knowing how to access what they need. Then definitely, definitely mm -hmm. need ongoing support. Great, thank you for that. Uh, now we move to another interesting questions about because in this election we are having two referendums that's coming, also. So this question could be yes and no. And if you have a little comment, you can add to that. Okay. So about end of life referendum, yes or no? What? What? Sorry, say about again. The end of life referendum. Oh. Yes or no? Um, that's a really personal one for me because I have multiple sclerosis, so I come under the bill. So I would rather not say it because it, it affects me personally. Yeah. yeah. Okay, good. Right. And cannabis referendum? Uh, cannabis referendum, definitely, yes. I would really like us to put all of the money that we're putting into imprisoning people, which has not worked to bring down crime rates or drug rates. Mm -hmm. into um, accessing addiction services and mental health care. Absolutely, it's just a no-brainer for me. And I think our communities would really benefit if they need addiction support for that to be available rather than the police gets called. 
Mm-hmm. Finally, I wanted to ask, what is one specific thing you can share with us that you will work on for marginalized communities in New Zealand if the Greens have another term in government? Um, I think our focus, and I mean my focus, um, has been doing a lot of the inequality work and making sure that our voices are sort of in there. So no matter what it is, whether it's housing policy, whether it's justice, whether it's education, that that we have an eye um, on the way that policies impact marginalised communities. So when we look at housing, for example, and um, we say, okay, we're going to clear the state housing backlog, it's really important to say, well, you know, our communities are larger, for example, in terms of the families. Um, They're being told by the state housing services that your kids need to move out at 18 and you need to um, uh, downsize the house that you're being given. And those policies are really impacting, you know, we're becoming homeless effectively. We have to go and rent really high rent housing because state housing is unavailable to us. So there's all the little details that you wouldn't know um, that that impact marginalized migrant communities that need to be built into every single policy area. And that goes for mental health as well. You know, we, we say young people need mental health care, but actually we also need mental health, um, our mental health system to properly respect and serve our marginalized communities in a culturally appropriate way. Um, and, you know, same with our justice system. Again, it's not okay that our police are surveilling our Muslim community. And I know this from working in the courts, um, and our mosque, when the uh, Islamic Women's Council is reporting hate crimes and hate speech and white supremacy is still not listed as a terrorist um, threat in New Zealand's system. So we need, a, we need an eye on our interest in every single different policy area. Great, Goris, we are coming to the end of the time and of the show. This interesting episode, the time's flow. We will give you 30 seconds. What do you want to say the last words for the voters, maybe, for the audience? What do I want to say? Yeah. Um, I want to say, please vote. Our communities absolutely need to have our voices heard in this democracy. Um, And if you do care about the environment and if you care about equality and human rights, please party vote green so that we can form the next Jacinda Ardern-led government with the Green Party in it. Great. Thank you so much, Goldwyn. Thank you so much for your time. And thank you for audience, for listeners. You are listening to this special interview that is a series of election interviews. We will catch up. ترشی اما دلت می سوزه تظاهر می کنی آشغمی این بازی هر روز نترس آدم دمه رفتن همش دلشوره می گیره دروز بگذاره این دلشوره ها از خاطرت می ره قول می دم سخنیست لاغل برای تو راحت باش دورم از تو با دنیای تو راحت باش نمیاد جای تو دلشوره دارم من واسه فردای تو به قول میدم سخت نیست لاغل برای تو راحت باش دورم از تو با دنیای تو راحت باش هیچ کس نمیاد جای تو دلشوره دارم من واسه فردای تو